the story, at least the story that we're telling here, starts in 2000, um, 1998 with the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Um, and his election was a historic election because it ended nearly a half a century of neoliberal rule in Venezuela, where they had two parties, not all that different from the Democratic and Republican parties that we have here. So there's a lesson right there where the two-party system collapsed that no longer was meeting the needs of the people and the Venezuelan people put in a left third party. Um, this was, um, and this, the, the uh, Hugo Chavez instituted a project which he called the Bolivarian Revolution. And that's what we'll be talking about today um, because I think the Bolivarian Revolution has a lot of inspiration but also practical information for us. And the Bolivarian Revolution has been an inspiration for the people of the world, um, and, but for the reactionaries, of course, it's been quite the opposite. So the first of the five characteristics of the Bolivarian Revolution, the Bolivarian Project, is the creation of a people's history, a history from the, the bottom up. Um, history, as, as you know, is mostly written by the victors, by the people who enslaved the Africans, who committed ge genocide against the indigenous, who exploited the workers. There are some exceptions, like Howard Zinn, um, the People's History of the United States, Hugo Chavez is in that tradition. He rewrote the history of Venezuela, recapturing the progressive aspects of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the history of Venezuela. And he named his movement after Simon Bolivar, who was, the, was known as a liberator in South America. He was a person who led the, anti, the colonial struggle against the, the Japanese, Spanish and um, he is a great hero, but he also recreated the understanding of, of, of Bolivar as a person who was an internationalist, a person who was for the integration of nations based on mutual respect and sovereignty. And Bolivar was extremely prescient. In the year 1829, it was he who said that the United States appears to be destined by providence to plague Latin America with misery in the name of liberty. 1829. Secondly, second lesson from the Bolivarian Revolution is an inclusive society. It's a society that has a special inclusiveness for women, youth, and people of color. In Venezuela, they say, the face of the Bolivarian Revolution is a female face. We can go into more of that, maybe in Q&A, um, but I wanted to mention about the, the blowback, because the inclusive society probably explains most of what the great animosity of the opposition in Venezuela. Um, and I want to quote Greg Gandon. He's a Latin American professor from NYU. He was actually supposed to be out here last month doing a KPFA program, but um, he got sick and didn't do that. But let, let me just quote him exactly, because he says it very distinctly. He says, the inclusiveness has awakened a deep fear in the primal hatred, racism, and fury of the opposition, which for now is directed to, at the agents of Maduro's state, but really springs from Chavez's expansion of the public sphere to include Venezuela's poor. The next slide I'm going to show is one of those pictures that really says a thousand words. It's a gruesome picture, so I'm going to just go through it very quickly, but it illustrates what Greg Gandon is talking about. The picture is taken from the social media it's a picture that was posted by the opposition people, um, and it's of an opposition demonstration. This is a violent demonstration. And in this violent demonstration, they came upon a young man, um, an Afro-descendant young man vendor, 
who they thought was a Chavista, it was the government, and they attacked the man, they poured gasoline on that man and set him on fire. This is the peop this is the Juan Guaido, the person who Donald Trump thinks is the president of Venezuela. This is who he backs. This is the alternative that Trump and Guaido represent. Three, changing um, pace a little bit. The third aspect is a special opposition for the poor and working people. Many of you are probably familiar with, with Naomi Klein and the theory of disaster capitalism, where capitalists use a disaster to push the neoliberal agenda. I don't know what the opposite of disaster capitalism, would that, how you'd call that, but that's what they have right now in Venezuela. And here's a good example of that. This is um, the state of Vargas. I visited there in May. Um, Vargas is a, is a town that, in a province, a state as well, uh, the mountains come down to the sea, the Caribbean. And it, there was a catastrophic storm there. And it caused mudslides. And it wiped out whole neighborhoods. Killing people was a terrible thing. After that storm, the government built those, these houses for the poor people. In fact, the government has built 2.5 million houses for the poor. That is what we call the opposite of disaster ca capitalism. Interestingly enough, these houses have a view of the Caribbean and they're right next to condos for the rich. You never see that here in the Bay Area. Now, why do you have a special option for the poor? Isn't that unfair? Well, the answer is that the state takes care of its people. And billionaires don't need public housing. They don't need public education. They don't need public hospitals. It's the state that has to provide it for those who don't have it. And that's the third uh, lesson of the Bolivarian Revolution. The third, the fourth is um, Chavez had an amalgamation of um, the progressive nationalism of, of Bolivar, the Christian tradition of a special option for the poor, and Marxism. And interestingly enough, and for those of you who are in the Peace and Freedom Party or in the Green Party, um, it, uh, it's important to realize that probably the Bolivarian Revolution, more than any other single event, has put socialism on the agenda for the 21st century. But this has not been the biggest crime from the point of view of the imperialists of why they're angry and want to stamp out the Bolivarian Revolution. The biggest issue for them is that it also stands for regional integration in a multipolar world. And that is a tremendous threat to the world's sole hegemon, the world's leading superpower, and the, the, the empire. Uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, very early in 1999, um, he didn't found OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Producing Exporting Countries, but he helped reorganize it and make, and make, it, make it a force. In 2004, he founded ALBA, um, which is an alternative to what the Americans, the US government calls free trade. It's fair trade. Of course, free trade is neither free nor about trade. In 2005, Petro Carib sharing the oil wealth with, reg with regional governments. 2008, UNASUR, which is a governing group for South American nations, and CELAC, and 2011, which was a um, governing group for the entire hemisphere, with the exception of the United States and Canada. And for that, he gained the eternal enmity of the empire to the north. Hugo Chavez passed away from cancer in March 5th, 2013. He had anticipated his, his passing. He had made his vice president, um, Nicolas Maduro, um, designated him as successor. Nicolas Maduro ran for the presidency um, and won in um, the march um, in the elections on April 14th. I was an election observer then. <clears throat> According to the Venezuelan Constitution, when the president passes away, 
you have to have um, snap elections within 30 days. It was a very traumatic time for the Venezuelan people, um, the passing of Hugo Chavez, and was also conversely for the U.S. government was seen as a great opportunity. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time to speak about this election. I did have a, this video, which I don't know if it's going to, if you'll be able to hear it, but let's see if you can hear this one. They have made a lot of progress. Uh, some of the problems that John mentioned uh, are serious, uh, but I think that the election in, uh, the elections in Venezuela, although some people have criticized the result, which is Hugo Chavez having won, there's no doubt in our mind, having monitored very closely the election process, that he won fairly and squarely. As a matter of fact, of the 92 elections that we've monitored, I would say that the election process in Venezuela is the best in the world. They have a very wonderful voting system where you go in and you touch the screen and vote the way you want to, and instantly that touch screen result is, is uh, recorded and can be transmitted electronically into the central counting headquarters, but it also prints out a paper ballot. And, and when you get through voting, you can not only have voted electronically, but you can look at the paper ballot and make sure that's the way that you wanted to vote. Then you put the paper ballot in a box and you can go back and check the results later on if there's any doubt about it. Now, how many people in this room have actually seen that in person? Um, it's just, just Merle Laura. In Venezuela. Like, yeah, in Venezuela. It's an amazing process and it's something that we could certainly use here. They have made a lot of progress. Um, let, let's, let's do a Q&A. Um, of course, there's a lot of stuff we can get into. But, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. The, 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 the computer technology, you're asking? No, I, I don't know enough about that. Um, so, Hugo Chavez dies. The country is in mourning, and the imperialists go on the offensive. They go on the offensive even before that. Um, and what's interesting about the imperialist offensive is that they're, they, they write down their playbooks. It's not like you have to sort of look at tea leaves to figure out what they're going to do, because they write it up. Um, one source is the Council on Fire, uh, Foreign Relations. Some of you uh, know that, that um, organization. Larry Shoup, who's a member of the Green Party here locally, wrote a book called The um, Wall Street's Think Tank. Um, also look at Brookings Institute. And they have these actual, they call it a contingency planning memorandum. And they actually lay out a game plan for regime change. Uh, they, I'll paraphrase it because they don't use the same words I use, but they say, if you can't take over a country by democratic means, then use violence. And um, if you don't like the way that people vote, call it a fraudulent election and call the guy that they elect a dictator. And, um, and then, it, even if he's very popular, you can create uh, instability in the country by inciting violence and by doing economic sanctions and by getting regional allies to put pressure on them and also by trying to get the Venezuelan military to defect. It's all in writing. So that's what um, Ch Chavez, excuse me, Maduro inherited when he became president in 2013. Maduro um, was carrying on the um, Chavez program, in my opinion, there's no daylight between them. They have exactly the same policies, but there were different international and uh, domestic circumstances. There were existing problems that Maduro inherited, namely rampant crime, inefficiency, corruption, corruption in his own party, corruption within the Chavista movement, corruption on the top and corruption on the bottom. Um, we, there's no, this is not a perfect system there. Um, in hot inflation, which is now hyperinflation, and a completely wacko um, currency exchange system. Those problems were existing under Chavez, but they became to the fore 
under Maduro for another reason, and that is because the bottom fell out of the oil market. And the ability to fund programs and to combat these things was severely limited during Maduro's tenure. And the violent opposition began their um, protests to destabilize the country. They're called warimbas. So for the, during Maduro's entire tenure, he never had a moment of rest. His feet were always held to the fire. Let's f fast forward to 2018. There's um, an election um, that's scheduled for the May 20th. And four months before that election, the opposition, the, at least the radical opposition, withdraws from the um, negotiations with the, the government. Uh, Maduro could have done everything legally on his own, but he has consistently been for dialogue and negotiations. The radical opposition decides, no, they're not going to run, they're going to boycott the election. And four months even before the election is held, uh, following the playbook from the Council of Foreign Relations, the playbook from the um, Brookings Institute, they called the election fraudulent, determined it was fraudulent. Um, now, there were three areas that were mentioned but in Florida, and maybe we'll get into the more details because there's a lot of complicated issues with them, but um, basically there was an issue about the dates of the election. Uh, Maduro said, let's do it then. Um, the opposition says, no, we want to do it. And the, another time, Maduro says, okay, we're going to do it that time. They say, no, we don't want to do it. They went through about three rounds. Finally, they um, wrote a paper, decided to, um, on, a, on a desired date. They got, um, the, the day was set for them to all sign. Um, a, a telephone call was made, made to the opposition, told them, walk out and um, and and then they didn't have and then um, that they so the goalposts kept on mo moving. Um, some of the candidates were were barred, uh, particularly Leopoldo Lopez and Enrique Capil Capiles. Again, complicated issues. Um, though I would say that the United States, they they were um, de arrested not for their thought but for the actual. Uh, criminal activities that they were involved in, and they were in, in the United States, these people would be doing hard time if not um, facing capital off offenses because both of them were participants in the 2002 coup against Chavez. And finally, um, um, some parties were, were so-called barred. Um, actually, what happened was that some parties actually boycotted previous elections. And when you boycott an election, uh, and it's very similar to California law. So let me give an example, uh, analogous example here. If the Green Party decided not to run candidates in a number of elections, statewide elections, what would happen? You'd lose your ballot status. You would lose your ballot status. And that's exactly what happened. These, these parties boycotted the elections, lost their ballot status. However, just like in California, you can petition to get your ballot status back. They, they, they refused to petition to get their ballot status back because their intention was to boycott, and now they have an, yet another excuse. Um, Trump, of course, um, was behind this, um, calling the shots, encouraging the opposition. Um, but he um, was joined, unfortunately, by 11 Democratic senators who also called the election fraudulent four months even before it happened. One of those 11 senators was Bernie Sanders. This is a picture that I took at election night. The polls have closed. We've gone to the um, CNE, which is the um, highest, it's the, it's the electoral, National Electoral Council. Um, in Venezuela, the National Electoral Council, the organ that does elections there, it is an independent body of government, and they've just counted the votes and announced um, that Maduro won. Um, in that particular circumstance, this is a nonpartisan situation. It's very, very solemn. Um, there, there wasn't a peep. Nobody said, 
yes or no or yay or nay. Um, but Maduro won. Interesting enough, um, some opposition candidates, and you can see three, this is Maduro, and then this is the three of the leading opposition candidates. Some opposition candidates ran. Henry Falcone, the leading opposition candidate to run, um, defied Trump. Trump threatened him and his family with personal sanctions for running because how can it be a fraudulent election if people were running? Um, he, he, he lost, but had they, the opposition, opposition united, they might have won, but that wasn't their strategy. They didn't just simply want to win the presidency. They want to overthrow the Bolivarian revolution, root it out completely, and that means not simply changing who is in the presidential palace, but really liquidating the revolution. And I should note that Maduro won, um, even though there was a boycott by the opposition, so there was the turnout was low, it was 46% turnout, which is about what we get in US elections, but very low for Venezuela. He still voted he still won with a larger percent of the eligible voters than either Trump won in the United States or Obama won in the United States in terms of percentage of eligible voters. We still have lower turnout here than there. So I want to conclude with just a, a few more thoughts because I'm trying to get this up to the present so that Laura can report on, on her eyewitness. Um, of, of the ongoing coup attempt and the resistance of the Venezuelan people. But um, I take this quote from the announcement for this, um, th this, this event, and I think, Laura, did you come up with that? Because I think it's, it's brilliant. It's, Venezuela is facing significant difficulties, and one of the worst is the widespread misinformation spread by governments and media. The, are, you, are you the author? It's possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Donald Trump. And Donald Trump, uh, this is an interesting quote by Donald Trump. He says, socialism is not about justice, it's about equality, about, no, it's, it's not about equality, and it's not about lifting up the poor. And you have to ask, is he talking about capitalism? I just got the word confused. <laughs> Unfortunately, the other side of the aisle, while opposing the idea of, of direct US military involvement, accepts all the premises of the Trump administration. And so Bernie Sanders talks about the Maduro government has waged a violent crackdown on Venezuelan civil society. I'd like to show him that picture of that young man being um, burned and have him yeah, right. explain, explain that one. <laughs> and even um, AOC. Um, she's she said she was comparing the U.S. to Venezuela, and she says it comes down to a question of authoritarian regime versus democracy. <laughs> but she kind of, who does she mean is authoritarian and who does she mean is the democratic? <laughs> so to conclude, Venezuela and the Bolivarian Revolution is an ongoing process. There's a lot of problems. Some of the problems are internal, some of them are external. But it's being squashed because it's a threat, or not being squashed, but it's attempting to be squashed because it's a threat of a, of a good example. The ongoing coup is designed to exterminate the Bolivarian project, and that means something even more violent than the coup in Chile in, in 1973 because the Chavista um, movement is very, very strong, and to destroy it is very, very difficult. Reverse the social gains that have been made, in the inclusiveness of society, and to revert Venezuela to a client state. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get a uh, volunteer to
time me, I desperately need time me. Um, it would be that somebody would hold this up when it's halfway, like seven minutes. Will you? Okay. So um, the green at seven minutes, the yellow at two minutes, and then the red means wrap it up. So what is your total time? <laughs> the total time About is 15? 15 minutes, because we want to have time for um, questions and answers. I don't know that I can... I'll try to stand because it's uh, <laughs> easy to, harder to see people, but I need to, my notes are on my computer. So I'm going to start with the bottom line. What is important for us in the United States to know are is it essentially three things. One is that people... I believe both here in the United States and certainly in Venezuela, whatever side, whatever end of the political spectrum they're in, want peace. They don't want war. They don't want military intervention. So that's one, peace, not war. The second is end U.S. unilateral sanctions. Sanctions are economic war. People die. They get injured. The, there's devastation that comes to a country when there's sanctions. I don't care what corner of the globe those unilateral sanctions are applied. The United Nations has in its charter that that's not something a nation is supposed to do, and the United Nations itself has a process whereby they can put on um, sanctions. But end the sanctions. And the third thing related to those two is respect the sovereignty of other nations. Again, they have elections, as our very own ex-president Jimmy Carter said. Um, they get in, they put their fingerprint on there, then they pick who they want, then they get a printout and they look to see, is, did this computer get it right? And then they put their little um, piece of paper in a box and their political parties, you know, observers from all the political parties there, respect the fact that they're not stupid. This leads me to one of the reasons why I think that it's so easy to, um, whatever the word is, bamboozle the United States folks. And that is that there's a hierarchy of blame. And here's one of the things that has happened in Venezuela, and Roger talked about this. The people who are in charge of the government are pissing the people off who are, think they should be the ones that are in charge of the government in Venezuela. And that's the European looking folks. But 51%, we had an Afro-descendant um, Venezuelan speak with us, and he said that 51% of Venezuelans are, are African descendants. Now, what I think he meant was that inside almost everybody there, there's a little bit of African, and inside a whole lot of people, there's a whole lot of African. And, so, and one of the things that they say is that Hugo Chavez came in mixed and left office Afro-descendant. And there's some famous speech where he said, oh, look at these lips, you know, look at this nose. He's got African in him. And when you look at the people, of course, they're beautiful. They've got more Miss, Miss Universes than uh, any other country, so that proves it. Um, but, there, but there really is a lot of beauty there, both in the countryside and in the people, um, but a lot of mix. And so that when Latin America has had as its presidents as its government, European descendants, and then they see these people who should not be in charge, in charge. That's one of the big, big problems, and that's one of the problems with the U.S. I, I, if I'd had time, I was going to look at the list of, do you know how many people, how many countries the U.S. has invaded since World War II? Oh, God. 70, something like 70? 80, 85? How many of those have um, the leadership had a lot of pigment in their skin? I wonder what the relationship of that is, but people then are willing to believe that that country can't manage itself. 
that they can't run their own country. And so that makes that third point, which is respect for other nations' sovereignty, very difficult for the U.S. and, oh my God, who were all those people that agreed that Guaido should declare himself president? <laughs> yeah, they, they weren't from the Middle East, they weren't from Africa, they, they were, some of them were from Latin America, they weren't from Asia, they were from Europe and uh, North America more, mostly. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, so those are the three things. Peace, not war, and the sanctions, respect na national sovereignty. I was thinking about how like conservatives say states rights, states rights, states rights. How many times have they gone into a state and said, I don't think you elected your governor properly. Yeah. But we're not the United Nations, uh, we're the United States. And we go to another nation and say, we don't think you elected your head of state properly. What gall. So the surprises um, that uh, happened when I got there and I arrived March 28th, the worst of the power outages had ended, um, but, the, but we still had some power outages. The worst of the water shortages have ended, but I did take more cold showers than I have in decades. Uh, so that water was a, a factor and heating it was a factor. But, um, but people were pretty much going about their business. I expected, I think I expected it to look like a war zone. I think that even though I know that my government and the media lie about Venezuela, that it seeped into me. And I know everybody's saying to me, be safe, be careful, come back safe, you know, that everybody's saying that to me also creeped into me. But then I, I was expecting people to be begging. I was expecting people to notice that there were a group of, of 12 American-looking people um, and be sort of angry or, you know, or be desperate and begging and homeless and stuff like that. I mean, I ride the buses in the East Bay and every time I ride it, I see a new homeless in camp, in camp not every time, but regularly I'll see a new uh, homeless encampment that I never saw before. The, somebody told me, however, that there are homeless and they are near the river is where they are. And the way that he told me, and this, this was Tulio for the two people, raise your hands, the two people that were also on this delegation. Okay, so this is Mama, am I saying? And, um, and David Paul, and uh, we're, we're there. Tulio was one of our um, organizers and guides. Uh, he said that somebody knocked on his door and said, what color do you want your house painted? And he said, I don't want my house painted. And they said, well, you know, um, we, we want to help paint your house because the homeless are giving the jobs of painting people's houses and then, in, and then they'll get housing themselves. So it was a way of them taking some responsibility, some effort, and doing something that a whole lot of people wanted. Tulio didn't want it because he said, paint somebody else's house first. I, you know, I don't care about having my house painted. But he got his house painted, and the person, <laughs> and the person who painted it got a, a place to stay. But they had that kind of another yes, um, the response, taking responsibility. You know, you take responsibility, and then you get the um, get the social benefits, and everybody has you know housing. I don't know that you remember the, the photo that Roger showed where he said that 2.5 million houses has been, have been built, even under Maduro, who has been under extreme pressure because the powers that be saw that when Chavez, super popular Chavez, for good reason, died, they saw weakness and they came on even stronger because they thought, we can get this guy. And so he's been under enormous pressure, and the economy has been under enormous pressure, all the people and all of that, and yet built 2.5 million houses. I remember I was in the, in the tour, we stayed near one of those beach, we stayed in that place, Katia or something, that, because it's near the airport on the last day. And I saw these structures that looked like they were probably um, the Venezuelan public housing. They looked pretty good, actually. And I thought, oh, I've got to get my camera out. I've got to take a picture. 
Okay, so a few minutes later, there's a whole bunch more, and then a few minutes later, there's a whole bunch more, and a few minutes later, they're whole, they just kept going and going and going. 2.5 million is a lot. How many people are in Venezuela? About 30 million. How many people in the, U, in the, the nation state of California is about 39 million? And the, and the, um, the land mass is, Venezuela is a little bit bigger, you know, but there are some comparable comparisons, you know, some comparisons that you can make between Venezuela, land and numbers of people, and diversity and, and agriculture and richness of resources in California. 2.5 million houses is a lot. So I didn't see people begging. Um, I was afraid I was going to gain weight because they gave too much food, as far as I remember, at the restaurants. Um, and uh, I also expected people to be emaciated, apparently. Um, because when I saw the people, they looked, okay, how many people have been to Cuba? I knew that would happen. Uh, and so when I went to so when I went to Venezuela this time, the people were more Cuban slim than they were before. They were slimmer than they were before. But I got to wear I my fashion statement for this part. I know all of you want to know fashion in Venezuela. But if you saw a group of people and you wanted to know who was Venezuelan and who wasn't, look to see who's wearing blue jeans. They were wearing blue jeans, blue jeans, blue jeans. And the women's blue jeans were like skin tight. I mean, if you've lost a lot of weight, they're not going to be skin tight. So that was my way of noticing that, <laughs> that they didn't seem to be um, losing weight. Not to say that there isn't a problem. They have imported most of their food. As you'll find out if you watch that Greg Wilpert um, uh, video that's on VenezuelaAnalysis.com, and I'll repeat that again later, but um, if you uh, notice that what he was talking about how Chavez tried to diversify but it is really hard to decide to grow your own food when it is so cheap to import while you're exporting oil. It's just like a victory garden. I keep thinking personally, there's some ground around the house where I live. Um, I should be growing my vegetables, but am I? No. Do you know why? It's so much cheaper to buy it, and it's better. But if it weren't, I would start growing it. But that's one of the, you know, that's the kind of issue that happens when they call it, what is it, a rentier economy, the tulip thing, um, where you've got this resource that when you can export, it's very hard to diversify. So let's see, how am I doing here? Um, oh, oh, so fears. I, so I've had a few fears, and people were like, whoa. I mean, I told one, one person, I have a daughter that's like 35, and she, they were saying, oh, she's a lot like you. And I go, oh, no, she's a lot more, more um, adventurous and, and, and not cautious than I am. And they said, Laura, you're going to Venezuela. <laughs> and I went, oh, yeah, <laughs> but that's okay. And what I found when I was there was I was afraid of what my country might do. I was afraid that they might decide to, to do drones. I still haven't figured out why Obama started sending drones to Pakistan and on what legal basis that happened. Not to mention that was 11 years ago, all the drones that have happened since. But I was afraid that that might happen. On the bus one time, somebody said, oh my god, what if <laughs> there was something, I can't even remember what it was that was happening. He said, oh no, what if we, this group of 12 Americans, cause an international you know, incident and they decide to bomb us because we're here? You know, it would be the exact opposite of what we want. But in terms of being afraid to be on the street, we did have security with us. We were very careful about things. We tried to not have our cell phones out all the time and things like that. But I was not, I didn't feel fear except for what I thought, you know, what I was afraid my country might do. And the, 
the, the playbook, the regime change playbook, and I despise that word regime. I mean, do the, the Obama regime, the the uh, you know Trump regime, the Carter regime. What is this with regime? You know, it's an administration, it's a government, Maduro administration. But they say regime because that sounds like something you can change. Um, but Guaido, who had declared himself president based on nothing, no, nothing legal, called for something April 6th, and that was going to be the last Saturday that I was there. I was leaving, I was scheduled to leave on uh, April 8th, but don't get me started about American Airlines canceling <laughs> flights without notifying us. And four changes later, I managed to get a 28-hour flight home. But that was the last Saturday, was April 6th. And Guaido had said, we're going to, we are going to have a demonstrations, and if that doesn't change the government, then, you know, Threat, 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 you know, you just can't, can't imagine what's going to happen next. And I was a little bit afraid, being there, what they were going to cook up on April 6th. And what happened on that Saturday was that there was an almost every Saturday rally in support of the government, including, I am sure, lots and lots of people who did not vote for Nicolas Maduro and who are very critical of Nicolas Maduro, but they are in favor of Venezuela, its constitution, and its government, and its sovereignty. And there were hundreds of thousands of people, and we were there, and I what, didn't feel afraid there. And imagine this. How many people have been to rallies in the United States? <laughs> okay, how many of you have thought, I wish there were more people here? <laughs> I wish they weren't all old people. I wish they weren't all white people. You know, I wish, you know, whatever. You know, we wish for all those things. That's what's in, you, go to Venezuela. <laughs> go to a rally in Venezuela, and you will see all of those people together. Why? Because, ironically, one of the things that the U.S. has done has pulled people together more. In a mixed neighborhood, in other words, opposition and Chavista, um, the, our tour leader, uh, Terry, s said that when the water, there was no water, everybody was helping everybody else. You know, whatever their politics, they were helping whatever, everybody else. And I'll end with one of the people that we talked with um, I, can't, I can't tell you enough about VenezuelaAnalysis.com. There's one A in the middle, VenezuelaAnalysis.com. But Lucas Kerner is one of the um, writers for that, and he spoke with us one dinner time. And he expressed, and I'll close with this, something that I'm sure a lot of us feel, is that he wishes that he didn't have to spend so much time in reaction to the lies, trying to correct the lies in defending the truth and could spend more time talking about some of the things that Roger talked about, which is the housing and everybody knows about the health care and all of those things. Talking about the positive, the gardens, you know, the, the, the organic food, the better, you know, all of those things that we want, not just those lies and those things that are coming at us that we're defending against that we don't want. So we'll close with that and we'll go to um, Q&A. And thank you very much for your time. So we're going to have Bill, Bill Balderston, a strong union guy for a long time, is, and a green for a long time is going to um, moderate the Q&A. And if we can, and, and sometimes, of course, people will want to make comments. But if we can, you want to sit here? Or? Uh, I, well, I need a chair. But okay. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you take that and I'll bring okay, it over here. Does that work? Um, so if, you can, if we can keep it to one or two minutes, please. And then we'll go around, and then if, you know, your question or your comment. And then we'll go around and then you'll have another chance because what time is it? Six o'clock. It's six o'clock, so we've got 30 minutes. So that will give everybody a chance to ask their questions. And if there's time, then you'll get a chance to, to talk longer than two minutes, okay?
and we'll try to alternate uh, in terms of gender and uh, again uh, please try to respect the time limit. Uh, yes. Uh, is there any move to diversify because it's a oil economy and what got them into big doo-doo is that when the oil prices drop the whole economy drops. Is there any movement now to to remedy that situation? Uh, yeah, there, there's been, I mean, they, they, they've literally spent billions of dollars on trying to diversify. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing, but it's particularly difficult to do under a market economy. Let, let me just give an example of food. In order to make your domestic agriculture competitive, you have to be able to produce food that sells cheaper than imported food. What that means is that the food prices have to go up. In a society where you have hunger and poor people, letting food prices go up is crossing starvation. So it's a, it's a difficult, difficult bootstrap type thing. Um, they, but the, it's, it's certainly not from lack of trying. But it, it's, it's, it's not something that is easy to do. And certainly no economy has been successful in doing that. I don't know, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I wanted to add um, to that, that one of the things that happened, and if you watch that Greg Wilpert piece in VenezuelaAnalysis.com, um, I kept wondering now, why in the world is the price of oil the, per barrel going down? And one of the things that happened in 2008, after the global meltdown, and, and who caused that, but there was a global financial meltdown, and people were talking about peak oil. Remember that? Um, it's talking about how it's going to cost more to get the oil out of the ground than it's worth, you know. And so the idea is to wean ourselves off oil. But at the time, as Roger said, People were still in need. There had been 60 to 70 percent poverty before Chavez took office in when before he was elected in 1998, and so he was there was still a deficit, and so the predictions were that the oil was going to go from hundred dollars per barrel to like two hundred dollars per barrel, and instead it went down. Why? Places like California were fracking using a truly um, essential resource, water, to pull oil up out of the ground. Yeah. And where, um, you know, the pipelines and all of that stuff. Obama, I think, expressed wanting oil su um, self-sufficiency, you know. So those were some of the things that were happening. At that point, do we help these people who've been poor for so long, or, and, and or and, and do reserves and do diversification, or do we try to keep continue to solve this problem with the expectation that the price of oil will not go down and is likely to go up? Um, Don, um, and then I'll come back to the front. Yeah, I like the question for the people who are on the delegation. It's kind of about language and it's about the image that Venezuela has here. The British Broadcasting Corporation seems to find it real easy to find people who are very good looking and speak English very, very well. And they are all in support of capitalism. They all hate the Maduro government. And that's kind of the image they get. And I'm wondering, is it doesn't seem to me that a lot of people on the street in Venezuela speak English like they went to Harvard. And it also seems to me that there's a big difference between the way these things are appearing on the streets in Venezuela and what we see here. And I look at a comment. No, the, the, the people particularly, um, one interesting thing that happened was that, um, I've lost her name, Empire Files, uh, Abby Martin. Martin. Abby Martin. <laughs> I knew you'd know. Okay, Abby Martin, um, who looks like somebody that they w could, you know, relate to. Uh, Google if you want to see some YouTubes with Abby Martin, and she interviewed uh, people on the east end of uh, Caracas, which is where the wealthy folks are. 
And they were forthcoming to her because, you know, she looked like she would be on their side. Uh, and so there, so you can always find, go, go to the, the East End, talk to people who have moved here from Venezuela, and they will probably give you an earful that will sound just like what Trump is saying and just like what the media is saying. Do poor people come to the United States? People that don't have much money in Venezuela. No, they don't. It's the rich people that come here. And so, I don't know whether this is exactly your, so your question, I, I think you sort of answered your own question. That you can no, all. I mean, I just wonder, did you run into people who actually spoke English in, in the everyday life in Venezuela? No, I, no, just our, our, our organizers yeah. and stuff like that. Did, did, did you? I know, uh, but, uh, but I had a, um, Mama? From, from the uh, delegation, completely independent from it, I found somebody who does speak Spanish and translate to me. Mm -hmm. So I did uh, also interview a right-wing youth uh, leader. She is very popular, she is well known, she goes on TVs and everything. You are absolutely right. When you have that culture, when you have that background, people are against Madura. And she kept complaining to me that her uncle, uh, before Chavez, was able to go to Harvard, and now she cannot. So this is the problem they have. But while, uh, while she is talking about that, uh, I talked to people who are getting uh, food subsidy, for, uh, food directly from the government. I interviewed them. And you should hear, and I'm going to prepare my videos for that. Uh, you really need to uh, hear that. Tremendously political, tremendously conscious. They know exactly what's going on. And they are very, very, very thankful to the government because, as I was there, they received a baggage like this big. It had beans, rice flour, sugar, uh, many other things that I do not know. But the prices had gone up that day from the previous month. Do you know how much they paid for a package like this for their whole family? 15 cents Ooh. in our money, 15 cents. And I asked them this, what if the, uh, the government changes and you do not have this coming anymore? She said, number one thing, it may or may not happen, is that we go back to the Caracasa days. This is before Chavez, when the stores were being looted, places were being burned, people being shot on the streets. She said, we may go there, but that may or may not happen. But I know what will happen is that we will die of hunger. So they are very well conscious of what's going on. Yes, they do not speak English, maybe, but uh, you know they can express themselves very well. And uh, I was not under any kind of pressure to who to talk to or not. Like I said, I got an uh, uh, interpreter, and we went to the very, very tough neighborhoods to speak to people. And it was just amazing. Thanks. Can I address this real quick? Uh, well, later. Yeah, um, I think when you guys were there is when the Russian and Chinese um, troops came. And what I'd like to know is, uh, it seemed to me like uh, that, uh, all of a sudden you stopped hearing about we're going to take them over. All of a sudden it just wasn't out there anymore. And I thought maybe uh, that's help holding them back. And another thing is, I, from what I hear, the Chinese are actually giving them uh, or paying for oil, even though I guess they don't need it, they're paying them for oil. So they're helping them. So I didn't hear you guys say a thing about that. And to me, that's sort of an important thing. Yeah. So um, the Russians, uh, some, some Russians arrived just before we got there, I think. Like Mar March yeah, right 28th there, yeah. was when the delegation started. Um, and but one of the, uh, they had all those power outages. And the longest one was, what, four or five days you know, across the country. And it was sabotage, but they had some Russian um, cyber specialists coming in to help discover how to get it all back online. And they, had, they continued to have some other power outages. One of the factors with that is that, I mean, it's interesting that some of the people whose power was out 
had never had so such long power outages, and some of the people whose power was out had, hadn't even had electricity 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So they still actually could, could deal with that. But the, electric, the demands on the electric grid have been greater and greater as the, the houses on the hillside and the barrios changed from being cardboard to corrugated mm -hmm. metal to brick to no pl indoor plumbing, to having indoor plumbing, to having electricity. So the demand has been greater. But the, yes, Russians, China a, a, it has been a trading partner right along. Um, even, and India has been. And so the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, except of course Brazil has gone um, yeah. Nazi. Portugal. Yeah. But in Portugal, yes, Portugal has been. So there have been um, trading partners that have continued and um, are, are, are part of Chavez's vision and part of vision that we probably all have is to have not a unipolar world with one superpower, even if it's the country we live in, but to have a multipolar world with power in many areas. And that's happening whether the U.S. wants it or not. Let's see. Oh, Greg needs to make an announcement first. Uh, so um, the Eagle Proctor Library here needs to keep its lights on. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to collect some money so we can make